The following program is a one-hour webinar on the topic of government contract terminations during crisis. Part of a series of HKA produced webinars on government contracts, claims, investigations, and compliance related topics. This webinar is presented by HKA's Government Contracts Group co-leaders, Greg Bingham and Jeff Duval. Rich Group, part, now part of HKA. And we work on, uh, we've worked on a number of terminations. When I, uh, uh, the A-12 was my first termination. No, I'd done like seven or eight terminations uh, prior to the A-12. And then that was, you know, hundreds of suppliers. And then it done at this point, maybe a thousand, uh, certainly in the high hundreds. And Jeff has done many, many as well. And so we we encounter lots of different things on terminations, and sometimes we end up uh, testifying on cost recovery issues related to contract terminations. So Jeff, do you want to say your background? Sure. Uh, and um, uh, thanks for everyone for taking the time this afternoon to join us. Uh, we're trying to keep it to an hour, just like John indicated. Uh, but I have a little over 22 years experience in government contractors with servicing government contractors, doing tons of terminations, claims, and REAs, as well as investigations. I've reviewed, audited, and prepared hundreds of termination settlement proposals, ranging from probably about $20,000 in value to well over $4 billion. Uh, I've negotiated with termination contracting officers with the government, I'm negotiated with the DCAA and I've audited and reviewed and negotiated with lower tier subcontractors. So what we're trying to accomplish today is obviously we can't make everyone experts in terminations in one hour, but uh, we've had a lot of uh, calls and emails from clients over the last several weeks because of the COVID-19 COVID and you know what impacts are they seeing on their projects real time, whether it be idle time or change work, delay, disruption, um, they're also concerned about being terminated. And, and what do they do if they get terminated and, and either today, tomorrow, or weeks or months down the road? So since we've been getting a lot of inquiries about that, we thought it'd be good this afternoon to, at a higher level, talk about uh, who's impacted by a termination, what goes into a termination settlement proposals, you know, some of the unique principles um, that you're allowed to recover in a cost recovery in a termination environment, um, as well as some um, best practices and advice that we can give uh, in addition to answering questions that come in. I think Greg, you can take it away. Okay, and so we will, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, you can add your questions and we'll attempt to get to them. And um, it, But we're going to cover uh, a lot of ground uh, on terminations and just here are some of the, the highest level uh, points is that it's covered by FAR Part 49 contract terminations. Uh, the CO, the contracting officer, will send a termination notice to the contractor and uh, the, the termination notice typically says that they're required to stop work immediately on the ter terminated portion of the contract and terminate all related subcontractors. Now, but the, the phrase here, terminated portion of the contract, you can have a partial termination so it's a, a part of a, a contract is terminated. The rest continues, and that's a uh, that, that's what the the reference there is to the uh, part of the contract. Um, so after that, the contractor must deliver. To, uh, there's termination inventory, um, and that's the inventory that's left over, if you will, uh, after or as of the termination. And these, uh, these forms, I've, I've seen copies of these, uh, the termination settlement proposal forms from the 1950s, and they're virtually unchanged from today. And when you think about the 1950s, there was a lot of, uh, a lot more tanks, aircraft, um, jeeps, uh, hardware. And uh, the forms are all kind of oriented toward hardware, toward a contract with hardware. And today, there's a lot more professionals, a lot more services, as you know, software development, things of that nature that don't, don't really have hardware, but the but just throughout our conversation for the next 50 minutes or so, you'll you'll get the impression probably that you know this is this process works well for something with a lot of hardware. It doesn't work so well with something that doesn't have hardware. Well, that's just that's just the process as it is. But anyway, the the contractor has to one of the requirements is they have to uh, turn in the, these uh, forms with their termination inventory listing within 120 days of the effective date of the termination. Uh, they then have to dispose of the remaining property 
in, in accordance with the TCO or the government's direction. So there, there's kind of a negotiation ongoing as far as how the government wants uh, the termination inventory to be disposed of. And then the, the contractor has to begin the process of settling with its subcontractors and suppliers. So what about prior determination? So <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if a number of you today are, are in that boat where you're, you anticipate a termination, you have rumors of a termination, but it hasn't happened yet. So these are some things to think about um, as if that's, if that's your case for today. Um, some of the key ones are the last two bullets that I'll, I'll spend a little time on. One is request for equitable adjustments for our, our REAs. I'll use that acronym. Um, sometimes contractors, they have some type of changed work or REA situation, but they're putting it off until the contract is over. And um, but and there's many reasons good people do that. You know, sometimes they, they don't want to have a adverse adversary relation adversarial relationship with their their contracting officer during performance. They want to wait till that's over. It, it, various reasons. It might take the program manager's time, distract them from per, uh, overseeing the contract instead of uh, working on an REA instead of overseeing the contract. But anyway, if you anticipate that you're you're soon going to get uh, terminated, then the REA is is now. You need to go ahead and get it now. Uh, part of the requirements of the termination is that un, all unsettled contract changes be dealt with as part of the termination. If you don't pursue the REA, then you could have a loss ratio and actually lose lose money on the contract that we'll talk more about. Um, so that that's one of the things you need to be thinking about if you're if you anticipate if you have an REA situation and you anticipate termination shortly. Um, and then uh, the timing set internal expectations on timing and results. Sometimes people think, uh, oh, we're terminated. That's the, this matter is done. We'll just recover our costs incurred. The program manager and the key personnel on the contract, they can go work somewhere else. Well, and that's uh, that's not typically not the case. The uh, the program manager may be a very key person in the development of the termination settlement proposal and in dealing with subcontractors and inventory. So you need access to that person to st continue at least for a while on the termination action. I mean, w one of the one of the deadlines coming after termination is within one year of the effective date of the termination, you should should submit a final termination settlement proposal. Uh, I will call those TSPs or termination settlement proposals. Um, that and that kind of gets things started. If you have subcontractors and suppliers, you probably will not have settled with those subcontractors and suppliers within one year. And so, uh, so there's many reasons why it can take much longer. Some the A12 took over 20 years. There was lots of disputes, etc. Some others that Jeff and I have worked on have been over 10 years. Many, many are in the five, six year range. So it's uh, it, it takes set, setting expectations internally about timing is a key thing. Uh, so, so FAR 49104 spells out contractor responsibilities after the termination. And, and I'm not going to read all these, but like some are stop work, uh, terminate the subcontractors, uh, perform the continued portion of the work, protect and preserve government property, notify the TCO of legal proceedings. Now, what legal proceedings might there be? Well, one is a risk reduction in force of personnel. Uh, you may have layoffs resulting from the termination and you may have uh, lawsuits uh, by people who feel like they were wrongfully terminated. Uh, there could be claims from subcontractors. Uh, what I mentioned earlier about you, if you have an REA situation that you might be submitting to the federal government or a higher tier, well, your suppliers may have an REA or claim that they've been waiting to submit to you or they've submitted and you haven't negotiated it yet or, or at some uh, anyway, making the, the TCO wants to be aware of that. that that's part of the, 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 uh, the directions. Um, settle with subcontractors and suppliers and submit, you know, uh, it, uh, any settlement with the subcontractors and suppliers should be subject, it is subject to TCO approval. Okay, so you, you don't want to unilaterally settle, but you, the responsibility of the higher tier is to deal with those and then get a fair and reasonable price in the settlement and then deal and then uh, request of the contracting officer for approval to settle. 
Um, there are some other, these are not in the FAR, but there's something that, uh, the, there are activities that Jeff and I often see in, in when we're uh, dealing with a termination. So cost accumulation, if you do it on a, if you do the TSP on a total cost basis, then it's, it's largely an accounting exercise where you are accumulating costs from your records of what you've incurred. Uh, budgeting and forecasting, there is typically a request from the TCO within a month, in my experience, I'd say within a month or two, but often typically within a month of the termination to get some kind of ROM, rough order of magnitude estimate of what the termination is going to be because the, the TCO, the terminating contracting officer, wants to know about funding, that they often will have funding obligated to this contract and they want to defund this contract to a certain extent. And so they'll be asking questions like, what's your estimate of what the total is? So that's something that, that often happens quickly and you don't want them to defund too much. And then you're later uh, submitted uh, an REA or termination settlement proposal that is more than they have funding for and they push back and say, hey, I don't have funding, you know, and that becomes another obstacle to you settling. Um, other things relate to reductions in force. Are you going to have layoffs? And if so, who are you going to lay off and how? And then training and reassignment of the people that are working with the contract that are they're now moving on. And uh, Jeff, do you want to pick up uh, from here? Sure. A um, couple things. Um, I should have mentioned in the beginning that I will be emailing out these slides to everyone following the presentation. So uh, you don't have to feel like you have to take notes quickly or write down all the relevant FAR or, or DCA audit manual uh, passages. So we'll be distributing that. And then uh, one follow up point on when Greg referenced uh, funding, uh, that is something that needs to be addressed early in the process. And we'd always recommend being very conservative. Try not to release any funding if possible. Uh, you will be pushed likely by the government to release some, but release as little as possible because as Greg alluded, these terminations may take a lot longer than you anticipate. Closing out your, your lower tier subcontractors uh, could be a, a long process and costs could potentially increase over time with unforeseen rifts or severance. Um, so you wanna make sure you don't you have enough funding because if you run out of funding, closing and settling these termination settlement proposals becomes very, very difficult. And that's often an impediment to closing TSBs outside of litigation. So, yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, the government may, may well have a, a contractual obligation to pay you. you have a funding, it funding, it's a problem for them. So you, you don't want to, you, you don't want to be in that situation. Sure, and on this slide that we have on the screen right now, uh, and Greg alluded to, uh, you're obligated in FAR 49.206-1 uh, to submit a TSP, a term, termination settlement proposal, one year from the effective date of the termination. Um, that doesn't mean you have to wait a year. That doesn't mean you can't submit multiple TSPs. Uh, it's common and what we'd recommend is as soon as you have a sense of what your reasonable costs are, you can submit an interim termination settlement proposal and there's no limit to how many you can submit. I mean, you want to be within reason, you don't want to be submitting hundreds of them, but you, you have to submit your final one within one year. Whatever you submit, uh, you have to be ready to settle for. Um, so it has to be what you believe is the correct amount at that time, and you can include forecasted costs, um, forecasted costs for termination settlement proposal expenses, for example, legal fees, consulting fees, your own fees as a contractor, and you know severance costs, um, but you need it needs to be accurate, auditable, whether by a, a third party, for example, the DCA or other individuals um, within the relevant agencies, uh, and they can be submitted as I said multiple times. But if you wait a year past a year to submit your TSP, you're likely will be rejected because it's uh, against FAR 49206-1. So on this slide, you see uh, it's a bunch of check marks uh, and indicating all the different types of forms that you typically encounter. Encounter. These are summarized in 449.6. 
but uh, we kind of wanted to give a snapshot of, of what you may have to complete. Uh, on the left hand side, we identified the forms. I'm not going to list all of them, but depending on if you're a fixed price contract, you're going to be submitting uh, one type of form. If you're doing a cost type, a cost reimbursable, you're going to be submitting, for example, the SF1437. And then if you're looking across the screen, uh, you see I have a check mark on what type of contract form and the SF is a government form. Um, you see all forms, depending regardless of the contract type, either fixed price or cost type, you can always submit, as you see at the bottom, a partial payment request. So, so that means when you're submitting a your original TSP, you can ask the government to give you a partial payment. And I'll discuss that a little bit more on the next slide. But uh, I would, when you get these slides, print this one slide out in particular and, and save it. And this can kind of be your checklist of, all right, is my, my termination settlement proposal under $10,000? If it's firm fixed price, then you do the short form. And here's what you have to submit, SF30, uh, 1434, which is the inventory schedule for a short firm, the short form settlement proposal, which is 1438, and then a partial payment. If you have a fixed price contract that's larger than that, then you can get into an inventory basis or a total cost basis. Um, and we indicate what forms would have to be submitted. It, and I'll just add while we're on this slide, the, uh, the, the preference in the FAR is for the inventory basis. And that kind of goes to my earlier comments about these were developed when tanks and Jeeps and aircraft and things like that were the primary things that the DOD bought. But the uh, uh, but today, in today's world, often you would prefer to do it on a total cost basis, so you have to ask for permission to, to not do it the, on the standard form. If you don't ask for permission, then you have to do it on this inventory basis form, which again is fine if you've got a lot of hardware. If it's not really a hardware-oriented contract, that might not be fine. Great. All right, the next slide, Greg. So this slide addresses uh, what I alluded to, partial payments. Um, when you submit your termination settlement proposal, you're allowed to ask for um, a partial, not a complete payment of what you're submitting in your TSP. We would recommend that you submit your partial payment request, which is a SF1440, in the same submittal as your TSP. Uh, there's really no point in waiting uh, to request a partial payment, um, I would recommend you get it uh, right away because it helps from a cash flow uh, standpoint. And in your partial payment, uh, you can't ask for the full value of your termination settlement proposal. But for example, you can ask for 100% of amounts that you pay to your subcontractors uh, in their TSPs. You can ask for 100% of your partial payments that you made to your subcontractors. Uh, if you're a contractor and you have um, low, some smaller, small business, lower tier subcontractors, uh, it, and they get terminated, cash flow could be really important to the survival of that company. So they if they submit their termination settlement proposal and the, and they submit a 1440, a request for partial payment. It's in the government's and you as a contractor's best interest to pay that partial payment. And, and if you pay the lower tiers partial payment, you can also include it in you as the prime as your request for partial payment. So you can receive that cash quickly. Uh, you can also get 100% of completed undelivered contract goods. So for example, you completed a widget at the contract price. It's been accepted, uh, but it hadn't been shipped before the date of termination. Uh, you're allowed to um, request the full price of that product. Uh, but then there's also other elements where you can't request 100%. For example, your inventory in WIP, uh, you'd only be allowed to request 90%. Uh, your settlement expenses to prepare the TSP, uh, you're only allowed to request 90%. And probably the most important item uh, about what you can is really what you can't include. You can't re include, include a request for a profit or fee. For example, your portion of your award fee or your performance fee. Uh, 
and a request for a partial payment. Those are items that are negotiated at the end of the TSP process uh, with the contracting officer, so they won't allow any early requests uh, for a profit or fee. So if you've dealt with terminations before, you may have heard the concept, uh, the fair compensation principle. And, and I have on the screen here, several places in the FAR where it's referenced. Um, the purpose of, of the fair compensation principle is the contractor shouldn't be harmed by the termination. Um, so the, the FAR outlines in numerous places, for example, FAR 49.201, that the contractor should be treated fairly. Um, and 49.206, which we cite often when we're assisting contractors, um, is the government really can't make you produce data that you didn't uh, maintain during the existence of the contract. So if you're a smaller contractor and you're doing firm fixed price contract, and you weren't tracking costs uh, at a very low level on a WBS, on a cost type basis, um, you're not required to go back and redo the whole accounting for your, for your company. I mean, that's not possible or practical. Um, you, you are still required to support your cost, but there's, a, a, there's lots of alternative means and methods that you can use to support your cost. And when you're doing that as a contractor, it's recommended that you reference the FAR clause 49.206-1, which I'll read, uh, when actual standards or average costs are not reasonably available, estimated costs may be used. Um, you'll still ultimately be able to uh, need to support an audit, but you're not required to kind of reinvent the wheel. Um, and at the, at the end of the day, you can settle in what is often done, especially on these the multi-billion dollar terminations I've been involved with, uh, they take a while and there's a lot of auditing, but at the end of the day, you typically settle for a bottom line number. Um, you don't need to settle for every single, uh, negotiate and agree on what's your exact percent profit, what's your exact dollar and whip, what's your exact uh, dollar over here. Uh, you can, at the end of the day, negotiate and settle on a bottom line number, and that's outlined in 303-5D. Yeah. I'll just add a few points on that. The uh, Like an REA, if there's an REA part of the termination settlement proposal, that's often a, it, you know, you don't have to decide how much are they getting for their REA. If they don't have to decide, as Jeff mentioned. Uh, there, there seem to be lots of instances where, like, uh, at the uh, uh, could someone mute or uh, but, uh, <clears throat> situations where small uh, contracts, sometimes construction contracts, are awarded uh, with adequate price competition so they didn't have to give cost information at the award. And then, and then, <clears throat> and during performance of the contract, they didn't have to report any cost information. And now they have a, a termination and they're kind of in the cost reimbursement world. And so they have to submit their costs and the DCAA or other government auditors want to audit the cost in accordance with FAR Part 31. So they say, look, you didn't account for your, you didn't pool and allocate your indirect costs. You didn't account for your, you didn't screen for unallowables, whatever. You didn't do all these things. And therefore that becomes a tension or a, fi a fight between the parties. And, and that's what Jeff is getting at. Uh, one of the things he said, you know, the fair compensation you know, what's the contractor to do? Now you can, after the fact, go back, go back and screen for unallowables and things like that, but but pool and, but some of that is, is very difficult to do after the fact, after you've already accounted for the cost. So the next slide we talk about profit factors and it's covered uh, in length in the FAR in 49.202B. Uh, there's in general nine accepted profit factors and ways to calculate profit. Um, as you'd imagine, this is a very sensitive subject in terminations, uh, and it's, it's often debated with the DCA and the contracting officer is, is, what, is a, what is a reasonable profit. Um, the FAR outlines these nine criterias. Uh, I will say the by far the most common are number seven and number eight. 
Number seven being, what was your assumed profit when the contract was complete? And you're at the contractor will need to support that with actual records of if you're 50% complete uh, through contract performance, demonstrating that what your profit percent was, was it 9%, was it 12%? And uh, supporting that, because that's going to be a heavily uh, negotiated uh, slash audited issue. Or uh, number eight is what did, what did you both parties agree to um, when contract negotiated B before you started work? What was your anticipated profit on this contract? Contractors can typically demonstrate that by uh, what was the cost build up in their proposal. If it's a you know $100 million contract, they originally anticipated profit would be 10 per 10 10 million dollars so uh you're you have to look at what's your percent complete uh, on the project but that would be ways to calculate uh, and include profit um in reality especially on very complex programs you're going to do a mix of a lot of these you may start with a profit number eight a profit rate complement that both parties agreed to but you're only partially complete so you have to factor in some of number six the complexity of what you're manufacturing so for example if a lot of the contract work in the beginning was um, very technical very sophisticated and the back end of the contract was more you've already had your learning curve uh, factored in and it's more of a production uh, you could argue that you may be anticipated on the pro on the contract of an eight to ten percent profit but the front part of the contract was the most difficult or the most technical um, so therefore that is all you got to complete because of the termination and in that instance you'd say if i was gonna if i the contractor was gonna just bid on that piece of work it would have been at a higher profit rate mm -hmm. so th there, there's no perfect answer but we'd recommend you kind of start with seven or eight and then you would make some adjustments from there. If it's if it, it's a rather simple contract where you're just delivering uh, widgets, um, th then it's a safe. It's pretty safe to to stay in the safe the number seven or eight, uh, on, which is on the screen, and then just reference the relevant um, support in FAR 49 b and I'll just add. So profit uh, item seven, uh, profit rate, assuming a completed contract. So that, uh, how do you determine that? Will you determine it's the estimate at complete, the cost estimate at complete compared to the contract value? And so, if the cost estimate at complete is higher than the contract value, that means you're going to lose money. You're going to incur more cost performing the contract than you're going to be reimbursed. So that's a loss contract. And the and the reason I'm pointing this out is uh, item seven is very important, as Jeff mentioned, and it gets a lot of audit scrutiny. So the DCAA or higher tier contractors auditing lower tiers, they will spend a lot of time getting at what was their e estimate cost estimate to complete the EAC as of the termination. So they can compare that to the contract value. Anticipatory profits. I would say this may be the number one question that Greg and I get when we get contacted about a, a termination. Um, and, and what does that mean? That means if you're 50 percent complete on the contract, uh, we often get the question of, well, can I claim the profit I would have earned on the balance of the contract I did not perform? And the answer is no. Uh, clear um, from the FAR 49202A, you are not allowed to claim profits uh, or consequential damages in your termination settlement proposal. Um, it's heavily audited, heavily looked into by the government. It's just, it's it's not allowed. So um, uh, I, I guess I, I don't have much more to say about that, but but it, 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 is, it, it is the number one question we get. And, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and contractors, uh, I understand and I, and I feel for them um, where they say I had a five-year contract, I anticipated this amount of profits in, in, in ten million dollars. An example, we, we only got two years through, so my profit I've only incurred, well, I've only earned is you know four and a half million dollars. Why can't I get 
the, the original $10 million that I anticipated because I am not terminating this contract. I did nothing wrong as a contractor. Why am I being uh, penalized because the government is choosing to terminate this contract? Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg and I feel for you and we understand it, but it just it is not a cost or it's not an amount that you're allowed to claim. Yeah, so maybe in a commercial setting, but not in a government contract setting. So some of the questions we get are from people in the commercial setting and sometimes in the financial accounting side of the company where they're like, wait a minute, we booked these profits. We booked this. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I know. I'm sorry, but that's 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 what happens. Um, adjustment for a loss, and Greg alluded to this, and this is kind of the same principle of you can't claim profit on work you didn't incur because um, the contractor can't make money on the termination. This is the same, pretty much the same principle. Um, if you if you're working on a firm fixed price contract and you are operating at a loss at the time of the termination, uh, you shouldn't be able to be made whole because of the term termination. You shouldn't benefit from the termination. So we only have like a sentence uh, uh, on here, um, but there is a lot to an ad uh, adjustment for a loss ratio. Uh, the DCA audit manual does a good, does a good job in chapter 12, 308. Um, they include two examples of how to uh, uh, how to calculate at, at, if your contract's in a lost position. Uh, for any fixed price contract, uh, you're going to need to demonstrate in your termination settlement proposal that you are not in a lost position. Um, if you are in a lost position, you need to make adjustments to, uh, for example, your, your, your whip to account for uh, what your actual loss is. If you're assuming a 10% loss, then you can't claim 100% whip. And then um, similarly, if you were going to lose money, you can't now claim profits in the termination settlement proposal. But uh, we'd be happy to discuss this in more length at a later time. But this is the most, one of the most complicated parts of a, of a termination in, uh, of a fixed price termination. And proving you're not at a lost position is very, very important um, for you to be able to get uh, profit and fee and a lot of your other costs. So um, I'd recommend you look at the DCA Audit Manual 12-308 um, for some detailed examples of this. Yeah, yeah and I'll just uh, add that uh, uh, you have to prove it. You have to establish it. The auditors can't take your word for it. They, they have to kind of automatically take a pessimistic view of what you say but uh, and, and look for documents. And so they will just, con so you can uh, provide them your program manager's narrative on why they think they're not in a lost position, but they they will need to see documents. They will keep pestering you until they get documents. And one last thing I forgot to mention, uh, often you may be in a lost position because of a change, uh, 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 which would have been an REA that maybe you didn't submit yet. That That's your opportunity to submit your request for equitable adjustment to the government if it's a government driven change, um, which would also get you out of a lost, uh, lost position. That's why in terminations, you often see a lot of requests for equitable adjustments um, uh, because a contractor may be prior to the termination hadn't submit the change order or the REA yet, um, but now they're terminated. They need to resolve all those actions and submit them, which if accounted for and your contract price was raised, you may not be in a lost position. And these are things that we think are going to be really important with the current crisis we're dealing with, with the amount of change order and REAs that we're going to be seeing in the coming weeks and coming months, um, that if your contract ultimately gets terminated, to make sure um, with our current crisis that you're evaluating uh, your change orders and REAs to, re to make sure your firm fixed price uh, reflects the <coughs> So changing subjects a little bit now, uh, and we this presentation is primarily about fixed price contracts terminated for convenience. And so if you and we, we were curious, uh, let us know if you think it would be helpful to have more a more in-depth uh, version like a session two in a few weeks 
And, uh, we, and if we did that, we would we could talk more about cost reimbursement contracts. We could talk more about like actual loss ratio examples. We could talk about uh, the the total cost basis versus inventory basis settlement proposals, which are very different. The forms that we showed you earlier, we just had a checklist of the different forms. We could actually walk through some of the important forms because that's that that drives the the format or the the structure of your termination settlement proposal. You know, those are all things that you know the impact of REAs on the loss ratio or on your recovery. We could walk through a lot of that kind of stuff. So let, let us know in, in maybe in text or chat if that would be helpful. Um, but but this is uh, um, this slide on the screen right now is 49.302 and it relates to um, uh, vouchering on a cost reimbursement contract. So cost reimbursement contracts are addressed in 49.3 and uh, and uh, a termination for convenience on a cost reimbursement contract is not near the impactful event or it's not near as important as a fixed price contract. A fixed price contract, all of a sudden the contractor is not getting any cash flow until they can submit their first TSP and start to submit these applications for partial payments. That cash flow crunch can be a significant problem. Uh, in fixed price contracts, there's a, a risk of the loss ratio and you not getting recovery of all your costs incurred. OK, both of those kind of go away in the cost reimbursement world for the most part in that in that you continue to voucher, submit your invoices slash vouchers after the termination, continue to get paid. You do have to fill out the forms, but it's not it's not as big a deal. And it comes down to, for the most part, how much the, the disputes or the controversy that we see in our practice is it, it comes down to uh, fee, how much fee that like if it's a cost plus a fixed fee, for example, well, how much of that fixed fee should they get as of the termination? That's even easier than award fee. Award fee with different pools, uh, award fee periods and award fee pools, that's, that can be very complicated determining how much fee. So that, that's where the issues are uh, on cost reimbursement contracts. Um, changing subjects uh, again now, to talk about there is within FAR 31, the cost principles are in FAR 31.205, and there is a special cost principle for terminations. It's dash 42. The summary is on the screen right now. The first sentence here, it's maybe my favorite sentence in the FAR, and it reads, contract terminations generally give rise to the incurrence of costs or the need for special treatment of costs that would not have arisen had the contract not been terminated. So it's Another way of saying that is you can you can do things quite differently uh, as far as cost reimbursement goes after a termination than you can in your normal world. If you're a cast covered contractor, you in some respects can do things differently than your cast disclosure statement would say. There's even a questionnaire on the SF 1439, the schedule of accounting information that asks the contractor where they have deviated from their normal accounting practices and then ask them to explain how they deviated. So, so these are kind of common. Now, I'll, if we had more time, we would cover all these in more detail. I'm going to spend most, we're gonna to touch on all eight of these uh, subparagraphs, but especially continuing items, item B, loss of useful value, item D, and settlement expenses, item G. And so common items, the A one is, uh, this is if you had inventory, let's say you're, you're building Jeeps and you have, you have a Jeep for the US Army and you have a Jeep contract for the Egyptian Army and, you're, um, and you, the US Army contract gets terminated and you, were, you need tires, you have tires on your Army contract and you need tires on the Egyptian Army contract. Well, if they're exactly the same tires, you should transfer those tires over to the Egyptian army contract and the cost as well. So you're mitigating the cost. That's kind of an example. Now, it, it, you, to, to be a common item in that regard, you need to be continuing to purchase these items on these other contracts. So you can like go to the other contracts, stop purchasing new ones and transfer them from your uh, terminated contract over to the other. And uh, I'm just going to skip on unless there's unless Jeff wants to add anything because that's not as important as in my view as this paragraph B, which is cost continuing after termination. And uh, uh, so costs which cannot be discontinued immediately 
uh, are generally allowable. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, how long can the, can the contractor continue to incur costs and those costs be allowable? That's the key question that, that, that is asked. And because uh, some, some costs, it's really hard to end incurring those costs as of uh, a specific date, like the, like the effective date of the termination. So examples that we often see include idle facilities, uh, facilities that are made idle by the termination, uh, unabsorbed or extended overhead, uh, controversial, you know, very controversial, and then severance pay. So those are some of the examples. Uh, a little bit on severance, and so I just jump to another part of FAR Part 31, the, the dash six cost principle, 31.205-6, is related to compensation for personal services. And so it address, addresses under paragraph G, <clears throat> severance pay. So severance pay is allowable if it meets the criteria as we as, as are shown here. Um, it, it needs to be reasonable in amount as, as anything in FAR Part 31. I mean, for a cost to be allowable, it must be reasonable in amount. And so what if you've got a, this is a question to Jeff, okay. what if you've got a, a French supplier who has very much nicer to the, con to the employee, uh, a much richer severance package than would be allowable, in the, than, than would be typical in the US, uh, but it's required by law in France. Is that likely gonna be uh, a reasonable severance pay? Do you wanna comment on that, Jeff? Sure, and uh, uh, that's uh, thanks for that question. And we encounter that often on, for example, major weapon systems or other contract or other large contracts where uh, components are procured around the world. Um, if you're, uh, with that example that Greg gave, a French contractor and you're required by law to give one year severance, uh, typically the US government would say that is not reasonable. Um, they under, understand that may be the requirement of that country's law, but um, you need to follow the FAR Part 31 principle of what's a reasonable cost, and it would typically, and based on my experiences, argued as unreasonable. So the question is then what do you do or what do you claim? Um, what we've dealt with and have been successful is to demonstrate what are other large multinational companies based in the US, what are they paying severance? You know, what is their norm for a comparable? If you have a, an individual that's been in the industry for 20 years, what is a, for example, a BAE, a Northrop Grumman, a Lockheed Martin, for example, what are they paying? What is their severance? And then reduce it if instead of one year, maybe it's six months. Um, and we've had a lot of success, uh, Greg, with that being deemed as reasonable um, and being able to negotiate from there. Hey, Greg, Greg, you're muted. Thank you, thank you. I, I do that from time to time. So then there's reductions in force. And so uh, it, keep in mind for reductions in force, especially um, things like the, you can have uh, different policies for different divisions of the company. You might have someone from another, you, you might have a IWO, intercompany work order type work being done at a major multinational. So, so let's say one division owns the contract and is terminated, but that division was buying, and I'm putting that in air quotes, buying services from another division. Well, what if the, what if the, policies are different at the different locations. Keep, keep that in mind. Um, and also different employee category can have different, uh, different policies with regard to compensation uh, after the reduction in force. Um, and the, the government auditors will often make the point that uh, these people were not terminated because of the termination, because of the contract termination. They will say they were reduced or, or laid off for some other reason. And so this causation point, the, the cause and effect relationship between the termination, contract termination and the RIF is, is what often uh, has to be established. And that's even spelled out in chapter 12 of the DCAA's contract audit manual. That's something that they typically would ask. Um, and that gets to bumping, it just what is that? That is 
uh, if you have 50 people working on the contract and it's terminated, do you lay off those 50 people or do you just reduce your headcount by 50 people? Well, most be, most companies are going to reduce their headcount. They're not going to necessarily lay off the 50 that were working on that contract. And uh, and so that's that's they that's the bumping phenomena. And uh, and it's it. Uh, it's typical. HR would get involved. One matter I was working on, they were saying, "Are you?" There were a bunch of mechanical engineers on the contract that was terminated, and it was very hard at that time to to attract mechanical engineers to the company. They were just in short supply, and they were like, "No way are we going to lay off even one of those mechanical engineers. We're going to lay up, reduce our headcount other ways." Um, and I'm going to go kind of quickly through a few of these others because they're. Uh, dash 42C is initial cost, starting load and preparatory costs. And so sometimes a contract can look like it's in a lost position because the early units, even setting up the assembly line or, or, or the inefficiencies that go with the early production uh, can make it look like the contract's in a lost position when it's really not. If you were to amortize or spread that uh, startup cost over all the units of production, you would see that it's not in a lost position. OK, and that's the kind of the concept that is that uh, Dash 42C is getting at. Um, it, Dash 42D, loss of useful value, that's a big one. And uh, and that it, it's getting at situations where let's say you acquire a, a specialized asset for performance of the contract. And then because of uh, the termination, you no longer have a need for this specialized asset. That's the loss of useful value. And so in many, in some instances that we encounter, the asset was acquired and put into an indirect cost pool to where it's going to be depreciated over, say, 10 years. And so each year, uh, a, a tenth of the value of this asset goes into an overhead pool that isn't allocated out to a lot of contracts. And now, because of the termination, you no longer have a need for this asset. So you're putting the remaining undepreciated value on the termination settlement proposal. OK, and so that uh, if if it sounds like I'm breaking every accounting rule there is, it may be because uh, there that is what I just described is something that is kind of a no no under your normal accounting. And uh, and it would be a long we could spend an hour on just this cost principle and how the accounting can work. But I just wanted to give you the high level touch on that and then we'll we'll move on to the next one. And that's uh, E, a rental under unexpired leases. Let's say that you, uh, you, you, you have rented a facility or an asset and now you're terminated and you can't, it, it, you, the rent goes for another three years and there's maybe there's, maybe you can't get out of the lease or, uh, or you pay a penalty for getting out of the lease. That's the type of, uh, item we're talking about here. And oh, just Greg, Greg, one thing on that last slide. Um, you are required to try to mitigate. So if you have a five-year lease for a manufacturing facility and you get terminated one year in, uh, you can't just claim the balance four years of that of the rental costs uh, or the lease costs on your TSP without proving your mitigation efforts. For example, trying to sublet the space um, trying to sell the space, um, you need to document what you've done. And if you go through all those mitigation steps and you still can't eliminate the cost or reduce those costs, then you can uh, include those costs under this cost principle. Mm -hmm. Good. It, and the next slide, this is a uh, pretty much this very, very similar principle. It's just more of altering the property. So for example, you had a a, a space that was set up as a laboratory um, and you couldn't lease it to any other individuals or companies because they didn't want a laboratory. But if you could convert it to more traditional office space, the cost of converting it to a more traditional office space would be an allowable cost because that would ultimately uh, mitigate uh, not being able to uh, lease uh, the, the building in its entirety, for example. Settlement expenses, uh, FAR 31, 205, 42. This is where you get to capture all the costs of everything that we've talked about of the preparation. This is the company's time 
you should set up a charge number and track your time for doing all these activities that we just discussed. Preparing the termination settlement proposal, negotiating with your lower tiers, preparing the inventory, uh, closing out contracts. Uh, those are all costs that it, you're allowed to recoup as an allowable cost in your settlement expenses. This also includes legal costs. Uh, the attorneys you hire to help you as a contractor with the termination settlement proposal is an allowable cost. That's 100% reimbursable um, if it's deemed reasonable. Same thing with consultant costs like Greg and myself and others. These are all costs that are allowable costs under this cost principle 3120542. Um, and the, the reason this principle exists is the government knows that terminations are, are unique. Um, so therefore, they don't expect every company to have the skill set to prepare their own termination settlement proposal and negotiate and close out one. So this is the opportunity for the contractor to recoup uh, the, the costs that are unique to terminations. And I'll just add, like, so the government within the DCMA, uh, there is a, a terminations group that's spread around the country, but headquartered in Smyrna, Georgia. Uh, and the uh, and so they have specialists there. They have people that are TCOs that just just terminate contracts. They they they're not they're not PCOs. They're not ACOs. They're they're just working on terminations. And so uh, it's helpful for the contractor to have somebody kind of specialized uh, with specialized skills, if you will, or experience on terminations. And uh, one of the one of the recovery issues that comes up here is for inside people, people in the company, at proving up the time they spent because sometimes they don't do timesheets and then later something they say, well, I spent roughly half my time or two thirds of my time on preparing the termination settlement proposal. Well, they need, you know, the DCAA or government auditors generally need better records than that or will demand better records than that. So this next principle, 3120542H, this is just settlement with subcontractor, your lower tier, your subcontractors. Uh, Everything that we kind of went over for the prime contractor is applicable to the subcontractors. The only thing unique here I would like to reference and remind people of that when you're submitting your termination settlement proposal, you don't apply profit to the subcontractors, TSPs. This is a common mistake that we see um, primes make. Uh, they will apply their profit percentage to a subs TSP, and that is not allowed that's an unallowable cost and now recurring issues i know this is your favorite jeff right yeah um document 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 um you're, you're here with claims you're here with change orders especially now in our current crisis if you're on a contract or if you're an attorney uh helping contractors um, there is a likelihood that we're going to have lots of terminations in the future. Um, as fortunate as that may be, um, there's a good potential that that's going to happen. Therefore, you want to make sure you're documenting properly now your contract performance because uh, when, you're, when you're terminated and you have to prepare the termination settlement proposals like we discussed this afternoon, you're going to need to properly document the cost the rationale for why someone was severed, um, the how you mitigated your leases, you know, all those examples we went through, um, you need to document. It. And the last thing that's highlighted on the screen is the most important. You know, the contracting officer may disallow all or part of the claim costs that are inadequately supported. And unfortunately, that is something we deal with, you know, in the hundreds of terminations that Greg and I have dealt with. Um, inevitably, at, almost in every termination, there is a cost that's initially questioned, whether it be the DCA or by the TCO or by another third party uh, in its entirety because um, the, do the costs aren't properly documented. We can often help them with other ways to prove the cost, but that is a very common. So document now prior to the termination will help you later. Yeah, yeah. and I'll just add so the the tco is the one that has to ultimately decide on the cost but the dcaa will sometimes question the cost in their entirety and the tco will be saying wait a minute they had to incur something here they had to incur a significant amount here 
but in the DCA's response is, yeah, but they haven't supported it. I can't tell if it's, uh, I can't tell, so I had to question it. Well, that puts the TCO in an awkward position because the accounting advisor to the TCO has just said, I'm questioning it all because it's not adequately documented. Um, and there have been, for the attorneys on the, on the call, there have been ASBCA cases uh, on this point where they, um, where the, the government auditors, all, the government all the way through is disallowing costs because of inadequate records and the contractor puts on all the different records and sometimes they're not accounting records, sometimes they're different types of records as opposed to purchase orders and accounts payable ledgers and all those kind of stuff you'd get from an accounting system. They're, they're different types of records, but they still prove up the cost to the preponderance of the evidence that the, that the ASBCA judge needs. And one of those I testified in, and uh, it was more, uh, I, I would like to claim credit for it, but it was more counsel and the way they put on the case to prove it up that, that won that point. Anyway, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so these are some reoccurring issues um, with suppliers. And I, and I would say the biggest, what slows down and, and why terminations take so long, um, is closing out lower tier suppliers. Uh, I've worked on a you know, large multi-billion dollar termination with well over 100 suppliers that range from a you know, $100 million contract to a $20,000 contract. And it took years and years to close out all the lower tier subcontractors. And the reason it takes so long is uh, often those lower tiers have their request for equitable adjustments, you know, their change orders. Um, they may have a, a third tier or a fourth tier subcontract that they can't close out and close out their TSP and so their their third tier or fourth tier closes out theirs. Um, so help the suppliers. If you're a prime, I would develop a system um, as soon as you hear a termination is coming on how you're going to help your lower tier subcontractors uh, submit and close out their TSPs. You know, develop a detailed process. Um, educate your lower tier subcontractors. Um, help them review and audit. If it's over, if it's below a certain threshold, that you don't, it doesn't require DCA audit. Um, as soon, the sooner you develop a process and guide the, your lower tier subcontractors, the easier the whole termination process will be. So that's the one bit of advice that I can give you there. And, and that's a place where Greg and I have spent a lot of our time over the years is reviewing and auditing lower tiers. So then when we present the lower tiers TSP as part of the Prime's termination settlement proposal, we can tell the, the TCO we've reviewed their lower tiers um, TSPs, we've made adjustments and we think they're reasonable. Um, which will help with the settlement process and then also keep in mind a TSP is a certification. So if you're a prime contractor, you are certifying to the reasonableness of your lower tiers termination settlement proposals. So as a prime, you do have an obligation to review and concur uh, to the best of your ability with your lower tier uh, termination settlement proposals. Uh, just the last couple things to close on. Uh, we hit funding early in this presentation. Funding is really important. Uh, just to bring it up again, make sure you have adequate uh, funding. Uh, communicate uh, with your contracting officer or your termination, your TCO, um, and do the same thing if you're the prime with your lower tiers because uh, they'll also have funding issues. Uh, unsettled contracts, uh, REAs, change orders, negotiate submit them as soon as you can try to get resolution on them uh, the uh, resolution rea would be very important when you're doing the last thing on the slide the loss ratio because uh you may potentially have an rea you didn't submit and if you do the, the calculations it may show you in a loss position but if you would actually submitted your rea um, and negotiated for a increased firm fixed price it make you it push you out of a loss ratio um, so those are kind of my closing thoughts on that subject. Um, and so we're, we're at one o'clock. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, here's our on the screen right now is our contact information. So if you're 
want to talk further about any of these subjects, feel free to reach out to us by phone or these email addresses and we can uh, we can talk further. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add, uh, Jeff? Nope. Uh, just as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we'll be e emailing out these slides to everyone that registered. So uh, just reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Try not to go stir crazy with all the social distancing. Take care. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.